Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and to introduce today's guest. Our speaker today spends a lot of time thinking about big overwhelming problems like global poverty and puts those thoughts into action. As the inaugural CEO of McKinsey Social Initiative, a nonprofit organization established by McKinsey and Company, Dr. Helene Gale implements programs that bring together varied stakeholders to address complex global and social challenges. McKinsey Social Initiative's first program, Generation, addresses the problem of youth unemployment in five countries, India, Kenya, Mexico, Spain, and the United States, with the goal of connecting one million young people with skills and jobs within five years. An expert on health, global development, and humanitarian issues, Dr. Gale was previously president and CEO of Care USA, an international humanitarian organization with approximately 10,000 staff whose mission was to address poverty. In this effort, 82 million people were reached in 87 countries. Dr. Gale also spent 20 years with the Centers for Disease Control, focusing primarily on combating HIV AIDS. Dr. Gale serves on several boards, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Rockefeller Foundation, and Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the American Public Health Association, the Institute of Medicine, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and has been named one of Forbes' 100 Most Powerful Women. Born and raised in Buffalo, New York, she earned a BA degree in psychology at Barnard College, an MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and an MPH from Johns Hopkins University. She is board certified in pediatrics, completing a residency in pediatric medicine at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. I understand from her staff, and she doesn't know this, <laughs> that she loves to dance, but they wouldn't tell me what kind of dance she enjoys. So just maybe after this event today, she might give us a demonstration. <laughs> Before I turn this session over to Dr. Jennifer Leaning, Francois Xavier Bagnard, Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights and Director of FXB Center for Health and Human Rights in the Department of Global Health and Population here at the school, who will conduct today's interview. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Helene Gale to the Voices and Leadership Series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Dr. Gale, it's a great pleasure to be seated next to you and have the opportunity to ask you a few questions uh, on behalf of the student body and faculty here. Um, I can say that uh, the notice of your arrival has created quite a buzz. <laughs> and it's, um, it's uh, important, I think, for us to have a chance to talk with you in this way because uh, you have um, reached a place in your career where uh, your leadership will probably shape a number of major endeavors uh, that from your platform you can launch. And I uh, have followed your time at CARE with real interest and uh, appreciation. And so I, I'd like to begin by asking you, um, in your last couple of years of CARE, what did you think you had accomplished? What did you believe you still had to do? Well, thanks. And first of all, thanks to Dr. Johnson for the kind in, in, um, introduction and also invitation to be here. And um, it's, it's also a real honor to be reunited with you. You are one of my all-time sheroes, and so it's, it's wonderful to have the chance to um, have this, this time to have the conversation. You know, and um, anytime you've left a job, you, you often look back and, you know, I look back with a lot of pride on what we were able to accomplish in almost a decade that I was at CARE. I also think about things that I wish I had, had done differently. You know, um, one of the things that I guess I'm most proud about is being able to take an organization that is, um, you know, one of the world's great institutions started um, back all, almost 70 years ago during, uh, at the end of World War II, helping to give out 
care packages. A lot of people don't know that care started from the original care packages. You know, as a way of, of um, helping to rebuild Europe after that war. And I think it was a real show of generosity at that time, an American organization um, being able to show that one day you can be enemies and the next day you can be handing out, extending a hand of friendship and looking at ways in which you can get past bitter divides. And we may come back to that issue, but really thinking about how the centrality of making a difference in people's lives is what does bring people together. And so, you know, for me, being able to be in an organization that, that um, embodied that was wonderful. But, you know, we were in a very different age than we were post-World War II. So, you know, aid started as kind of a handout. How do you give people food? How do you um, help people with their basic needs? And, you know, that's was very appropriate those times. But I think an organization like CARE to be relevant had to continue to keep um, remaking mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And so it went from an organization that, as I often say, gave people a fish to one that started building capacities and helping people to fish to when I entered being an organization that was thinking about how do you make sure there are enough fish in the stream and how do you revolutionize the fishing industry, if you will. And so really looking at more of the underlying causes of poverty. What are the things that keep communities mired in poverty to begin with? And I think we did a lot to really build that notion out of how do you look at not just the consequences of poverty, but how do you really look at the root causes? And that's something that I think we do as public health practitioners anyway. How do we look at the things that are not just the uh, fixes for diseases, but how do you look at the issues that are beneath the surface? So, you know, looking at that notion of, of attacking underlying causes of poverty is one of the things that I think, you know, I feel really good at how we were able to, to evolve the organization. And one of those key issues was the role of women and how women are so influential in uh, as both you know, going where the problem is, as an epidemiologist, you know, you know, we know that uh, women and girls are the most impacted by poverty around the world. But beyond just going where the problem is biggest, we know that if you can make a difference in the life of a girl or a woman, then you can have catalytic change that goes beyond just that girl or a woman. So if you give a girl an education, she's more likely to marry later. Uh, she's more likely to have an income, be able to send her children to school, and then that starts a different kind of cycle. So that, you know, if I think about one of the things that's a real cornerstone, it was looking at this notion of underlying poverty, linking that to how do we make sure that we think about empowering girls and women in our work, and looking at longer term solutions in the way that we uh, focused on eliminating extreme poverty around the world. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, one of the things about uh, women that is said, I'm not sure it is entirely accurate, but it, it does feel familiar to me, um, is that women are particularly good at setting up or maintaining networks, different kinds of networks, different connections that are within the family, but also through friendship or work or community circles. And uh, in, in Thinking how you have moved through your career, to what extent would you say women in networks has been important, and to what extent would you say it actually comes down to some combination of sheer grit, talent, and luck? In other words, individual, or to what extent would we think that women might have a step forward through their networks? Yeah, well, I think um, I'll... S I'll step back maybe a little bit from from network specifically because I think that it, I think that that is important. But you know I think um, to the topic that uh, of this whole issue of leadership, um, I think one of the interesting things is how important the way women lead is really much more um, suitable for today's world. So you know I looked at, uh, I remember reviewing some work on uh, leadership not too long ago and came across a, a, a study that looked at, you know, kind of attributes of, of leadership. And they talked about the coach, the famous coach from um, North, North Carolina, 
uh, Shish, uh, from Duke. Uh, sorry for those North Carolina <laughs> from, from Duke. Um, Shashevsky, who was yeah. one of the w most winning coaches um, in history, and they said that he was so successful because he coached and led like a woman. And when they and what they meant by that was that he focused a lot more, not just on core techniques, but really thought a lot more about um, people's. Uh, emotional mindsets, their overall needs, establishing teamwork, looking at how you knit together networks in, in that sense, and that, that his style of management was much more akin to, uh, to uh, how women lead, which is, you know, I kind of characterize it as being more horizontal than vertical, mm -hmm. and that that was what helped him become a winning coach. So I think it says, you know, it says that Men, too, can lead like women if they look at what are some of those attributes that are more suited for today's world, where we have to work in teams, where we have to work across boundaries, uh, where women are much better at thinking about consensus, thinking about looking at individuals' needs and how those merge into developing team and teamwork. So that's networking, I think, in a broad sense. And I think those are the kinds of skills that oftentimes women are better at bringing to the table. Um, than you know, men traditionally have been. But I think it also says that men can pick those things up and it isn't just something that is resident within women if we think about how do we look at those attributes and, and lift those up as being positive today more than I think we have in the past. Mm -hmm. Even your answer is inclusive. You know, men can learn to lead like women. <laughs> men too can be good women. There you go. <laughs> Um, so I, I would like to go, um, you know, not that far back in time, but a little bit far back. And uh, you, um, this is my guess, you went to medical school, did your residency in pediatrics, and then went to public health school. Is that right? Okay. Um, or you went to public health school before you went? To residency. Okay, right. in between. Right. Yeah. So a as part of medical school. Right. So there's so, there are a fair number of students who do this somewhere between their third and fourth year or after fourth year, et cetera. Anyway, that was the point. Right. Um, so that that actually makes my question even um, more succinct. How did your training in public health affect how you practiced medicine, and then what you thought about in the next phase of your life? How did it inflect your career choice? Yeah. So when I went. You know, when I went into medical school, I, you know, I went into medical school because I knew that I wanted to have something tangible that allowed me to make a social contribution. Medicine seemed to make sense. Health is so central in people's lives. But I also knew that, um, you know, I'd always been kind of a social activist. I knew that I wanted to do something that looked, you know, uh, more broadly at, you know, populations. But I didn't have a real strong sense of what that was and you know happened to have the opportunity to hear some speakers in public health and thought wow maybe this is what I've been looking for um, did my fourth year of medical school as a as an MPH year and then as I was thinking um, about uh, what I wanted to do knew that I also thought that it made sense to get a residency in pediatric probably because it does have kind of that preventive notion to it but I, when I went into my residency yeah, uh, I started seeing things like children coming in and out of the emergency room who clearly the issues that they were facing had more to do with the fact that we didn't have a system mm -hmm. that allowed for um, support of patients, that we had, um, we didn't have good medical home for people who were um, unemployed or underemployed, and that there were these system things that were the reasons that I saw children rotating through emergency rooms who should have been going to, to um, you know, pediatricians or, or clinics, et cetera, and that a lot of care issues really had more to do with systems than they did with individuals. And so that led me to, and kind of, I think, my public health view helped me to see things differently during my residency that confirmed for me the fact that I wanted to get greater experience in public health um, as well, and, and a practical experience beyond my MPH years, and that's what led me to the Centers for Disease Control. And you, at the CDC, had an illustrious career, and it um, focused uh, in large measure. I mean, there were a range of things you did, but it, it focused 
um, during the hot light of the peak of the HIV AIDS epidemic here in the U.S. as well as overseas. And you were, you were really very much in the forefront of a number of initiatives. How would you characterize the, the leadership challenge you had? I know you had several roles, but just, if you could just pick one of them, and what was a, a really key leadership challenge you faced in the context of leading the public health approach to HIV AIDS? Well, I think when I, you know, when I think back on the years that I was um, beginning my work with HIV in the mid to late 80s, the picture for HIV was very different. It was very different both because of the community response or lack thereof, as well as what we had to offer people um, with HIV. And so, you know, the issues of fear, stigma, discrimination, uh, marginalization were much more on the forefront, both here in this country and, and around the world. And so, you know, I think some of the biggest challenges that I had were just bringing communities together, helping communities to accept the reality of HIV AIDS and helping policymakers to be able to make um, uh, informed, evidence-based decisions around our response to the HIV epidemic. Um, and so, you know, in, in lots of ways, a lot of what we spent our time doing, besides scientific work and programmatic work, was really being a bridge to, to multiple communities and, and trying to help to heal a lot of the divides that were part of the HIV epidemic. You know, so whether it was um, helping communities accept um, gay the issues related to homosexuality, gay men, the risk particularly in communities of color uh, and, and the HIV epidemic, issues related to drug and, and, and drug use that were incredibly uh, challenging at those times. But I think in many ways we, we had to be a bridge in an issue that was incredibly divisive at that point in time. Um, and, you know, continue, you know, that hasn't stopped. But, uh, you know, at that time, it was particularly acute. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of you who are students may not remember how, um, and may not have read how very difficult those years were in terms of the kind of social stratification and um, issues of understanding the spread of that disease really were. Uh, and the fact that you were able to make those bridges, make those connections, and lead within the CDC uh, and actually in the wider span of U.S. government, I think is, is remarkable. Uh, how could I ask you, um, did you do that? You must have faced some obstacles as you were trying to create a sense of networks to communities, connections of inclusion, um, at, while at the same time saying there are, are at risk areas where we really need to focus without stigmatizing those at risk communities. What, what was the, what was tough for you in terms of um, all the conversations you had to be in? Well, you know, first, you know, just to go back, I mean, I think um, one of the reasons why for me HIV AIDS was such an important public health issue is that it really did play on the fault lines of our society. And so, you know, while obviously anyone can, uh, a, can contract a virus, um, HIV disproportionately impacted communities that were stigmatized, marginalized already in our societies. And so it meant that, you know, in dealing with HIV, you had to bring people to the table who many people were not used to dealing with. Uh, you know, I always say whether it's HIV or any other issue, it does to get people in the on the same page. You start with what are the issues that people have in common, and I think a core fundamental thing is that nobody believes that people should die unnecessarily, and that all human life does have value, and even populations where people may be marginalized. I think most common most uh, people of goodwill will accept that needless death. Um, is something that we should avoid. And so if you start from a position of commonality and begin to show people um, how do we value each other as human and how do you show the humanity of a group of people, I think you can get people on the same page. And I think you can get people looking past their biases, looking past 
um, you know, issues of, of st stigma and discrimination. But I think you have to start with some of those sometimes very, very core um, basic principles to be able to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. Moving into your um, leadership of care, uh, you know, it's Care International. Um, you presumably had to travel a great deal, at least at certain phases of your leadership of in care. Uh, could you tell us one or two places where you faced a significant leader leadership challenge, whether it was working with the big, powerful NGOs around the world, with governments, with the UN? Where did you realize that um, actually you had already developed a lot of leadership muscle and had to use all of it? Um, you know, I think one of the one of the issues that around the world is one that is difficult and sometimes contentious is the issue of access to uh, contraceptive and family planning for for women, and it's a it's a big challenge I think globally because in many cultures um, it is including one might say our own, but mm -hmm. um, you know it, it's I was still. Going to suggest that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mm -hmm. I can tell by yeah. the. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I think it, it continues to be a, a challenging issue. And again, I, um, I go back to how do you start difficult conversations? I think you start from positions of commonality and things that you think people can agree upon. And you know, one of the things that I think most people can agree upon that is that women having children too frequently, um, too close together is not good for the health of the woman or the health of the child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often talk to policymakers about things like healthy births and child spacing as a way, and mother's health as a way of introducing the issue of, you know, contraception. And if you can start with a set, from a point of commonality and, and realize that, you know, probably there's 75 percent agreement on, on some of the core issues, then it's easier to start getting into some of the more difficult aspects mm -hmm. of uh, the issue of access to, to uh, family planning and contraception for women around the world. So that's just one example, but I think again it, it goes back to, you know, starting difficult conversations is a lot easier if you start them from a place of commonality than if you start them from the places that you know you're going to have the greatest disagreements. Mm -hmm. Was there a, I'm going to come to the McKinsey uh, role in a moment. Uh, but if you could um, think about one decision that you had to make within your care career, um, your leadership of care, that involved you having to say no, um, a difficult no. Um, and you may not, it may not come to your mind right now. Um, and you can say, let me think about it, and I will ask you a question about McKinsey. But I, I believe that being at a top leadership position in such a multifaceted outfit as CARE is going to have some things come to your plate that are that are hard things, right? That's what you have to deal with. And saying no is one of the hard things. Well, um, I guess if I think about some of the, the challenges that are that were the most difficult during that time, it, you know, wh whenever you take on big challenges like ending global poverty, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot to be done there. Yeah. And I think for anybody in a leadership role, one of the biggest things is how do you keep an organization focused? Because you can't be all things to all people. And, you know, I think if you, you do and you try to, you, you risk not being able to have any impact at all. And so, you know, I think just in a ge general and generic sense, the ability to stay focused and have some pretty clear and tangible goals was often difficult. I got, you know, so many great ideas offered or offers of help to do things that would have taken us off course as an organization. So I think that keeping focus is, is a big part, and it's a big part of, uh, you know, what I think a leadership uh, role is about. But the, the biggest difficulty um, and challenge sometimes is less about um, your particular mission and the content of it, but it's the actual organization itself. Mm -hmm. And I think as somebody, uh, you know, many of us who are 
trained in the technical areas that we work in think a lot more on the content. Did we get the content right? Did we have the right strategy? But oftentimes, it's the organizational things that are the ones that um, will cause you to fail in your mission. And as a not-for-profit, one of the biggest challenges was just funding. And I think for me, one of the hardest things was the reality that at some times you have to make really difficult decisions about people um, and organizations that mean you know, cutting things out of your budget. Sometimes that means making difficult people decisions. We went through a very difficult time, particularly around the time of the financial mm -hmm. crisis, where I had to do some major layoffs. And you know, th having to tell people who have given of their life and their soul for decades to an organization that they no longer had an organizational home was probably the hardest decision I ever had to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, knowing a little bit about your leadership and management style, I would say that um, you probably made that toughest of conversations a little bit easier for them than if they'd had a different boss. Um, that's just my observation. Um, well, I hope so. And, you know, um, at the end of what was probably the biggest organizational, as they say, restructuring that we had to do, you know, I had many of the staff come and, and say just that, that, you know, this was a very difficult situation for me, for my family. But the way you manage this, and the way not just me, but our team, and uh, you know, I hope that's a reflection of leadership, that I set a certain tone about how we would do this and what kind of dignity we would try to leave our staff with. Uh, you know, people said that you know, even through all, all of that, they still felt like they were cared about as individuals. And I think at the end of the day, you know, it's another part of a role of a, of a leader is to make sure that people within your organization feel that ultimately they are cared about as well, because after all, you know, our missions aren't accomplished unless, you know, we have people who are, you know, part of those teams. I have one uh, question from the online audience, and uh, I would like to see if you could weave it into um, some points you'd like to have the audience hear from you more spontaneously, not a prompting question. Is that okay? Um, so uh, one of the questions is um, it, how social enterprise, because your McKinsey job is going to be um, at least in some ways like that, how does um, social enterprise fit into the development, um, the human empowerment work, the poverty eradication efforts of many of the other, the nonprofits and the governments. So what is the niche for the McKinsey Social um, Initiatives? But it's also, um, it's also, my question is linked to, wh what did you think that niche was going to be? And then how in the year that you've the short year, actually, not full year that you've been in McKinsey, how has that actually transformed your thinking about what McKinsey would be? So, so the question is a link of what is, what does a social entrepreneur, social enterprise um, effort do in the niche that you've seen between government and large not-for-profits? And what did you conceive it to be uh, when you were approached and worked with McKinsey this last year? Okay. So, um you know, I went, when I decided that um, about a decade as leader of care was probably a, about the right time and we had gone through a couple of rounds of, of strategies and we were coming to the, the end of some of the things that I had tried to accomplish, when I, you know, um, decided it was time to, to step down, you know, I thought about ways that I could continue to do things that, that might be able to contribute and have a social impact. And I thought, you know, I'd been in government, I'd been in private philanthropy at the Gates Foundation and then um, running a, a not-for-profit being at CARE, and uh, had also had some involvement, particularly in the role of CARE, uh, working with the private sector and thinking about how do you blend all of those worlds together. And this, this role of um, starting to launch this McKinsey Social Initiative came up and it looked like it might be a, a really great mix. And 
And you know, it's still very much a work in progress, and, and we're really looking, stepping back and thinking about what does it mean to take the assets of a large global firm like McKinsey and deploy that um, as a way of creating social good that looks at bringing all those different sectors together. So you know, that's kind of why I went there and, and what I'm hoping to be able to, to create while I'm there. But part of that is that I really do think that when you think about how do you make a difference in big global problems, we have been, thought about it so much in isolated buckets. So you have the public sector that does its thing and the not-for-profit sector and the private sector. And I think more and more the lines between those kinds of organizations are becoming blurred. And it's why I like this notion of social enterprises so much because, you know, you take, you take kind of the entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector and look at how do you use um, the development and deployment of capital in a way that creates social good. And you know, more and more, if you look at what companies are doing in what used to be traditional corporate social mm -hmm. responsibility, it's moving from go do something that's outside of our core business to doing things that actually um, are aligned with our mission in ways that use economic engine to create social good. When I was at CARE, we did a lot of work in developing um, social businesses. Take something that started as a grant um, and pilot that and look at you know, how that works and then use that as ways that can create actual businesses. So we had a wonderful program that we worked with Danone, the company that uh, does yogurt and other things, um, and, and a few other um, companies where we had almost like, you'd call them almost like Avon ladies, who would take a, a bucket of, of products that were from different companies that were interested in expanding their markets, but they would be able to go and sell door to door products that were essential goods that were necessary in those communities. They earned an income stream. Those same companies were able to then also begin to explore different markets. They get a, you know, they get commercially rewarded. Women get an income stream right. and you have a win win situation. And so I think more of those kinds of ex experiences where, you know, renewable capital is a, an engine for actually creating social good, I think has a lot of benefit for the future. And I think it, all, it does two things. It, it not only helps to um, fuel economic development in, in poor areas, but it also means that you're changing business practice oftentimes at the same time. And so I think the more that we can work across these lines, we all gain because we learn something from different skills that we might not have resident in the social sector from the private sector. Private sector learns more about how it can contribute to social good. And I think in the end, those kind of blended experiences really have the, the potential for creating um, you know, different ways of social impact. We're going to have to end now. I would just like to make this um, observation that in that last answer, you can sort of see why McKinsey said, this is our person, right? Uh, um, the complexity of how you think, and that, to m my view, translates into the delicacy as well as the force with which you lead um, is um, remarkable. Just, just having you share some of your thoughts about um, your life and your thoughts for McKinsey and for all of us ahead is really um, a fantastic opportunity for us. And would you join me in, in thanking our marvelous guests?